All right, thank you, Brother Tim, and thank you, musicians, and appreciate your being here this morning. We're in the book of Micah for this second Sunday. Micah has seven chapters, and I've tried to endeavor, not that it'll be successful, try to endeavor to cover these uh, in the last two weeks, or these last week and this week. Got through chapter one-ish last week, so you'll see what that means for today. So, do what we can. Um, but as we look at this morning's um, message and look at this passage, we're just making, uh, I, I remind you that the Lord um, impressed me with this passage back in November, and uh, I don't know where we were in our study in First Corinthians, but uh, it was one of those things that struck me, especially with today's um, Today's flavor of, of um, making choices, not always considering that there are causes that are based on consequences that come from the choices that we make. So that is the uh, title of the message last week, and it's Causes, Consequences, and Choices. And Micah, um, a lot of the minor prophets, I know that a lot of believers don't spend uh, a ton of time reading uh, the Old Testament. Uh, I don't think that's a good thing. I referenced last week that uh, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that we're to take the prophets as an example of suffering and affliction and of patience, and we're to look back at the Old Testament and learn from that what God would have for us. I think have for us, and I think uh, through Derek's Sunday school class, he's pretty much making that point. He's focused on the Old Testament and uh, making application from those lessons learned there. So today, however, as we're approaching Micah. It's that very theme to me that seems necessary for us and that I was burdened about when I read it. And that is, sometimes we land at a place in life and we wonder how we got there. And uh, sometimes we act a little bit like that little child who is asked why they did a certain thing that was uh, perhaps uh, breaking the rules or, or uh, disobeying. And we often get back that response when you ask a child, why did you do that? Their response is, I don't know. And, and yet, I don't really think we're as mindless as that in understanding that we can understand where we're going to land in our future and think about those consequences that are going to affect our lives if we'll, in, if we'll inspect the causes uh, or the dri driving factors of our lives. And this is for sure. God has given everyone in this room life and breath. It is, according to the scriptures, that it is appointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment. It's important for us to consider the truth that we're all going to stand before God and give an account of the life that we've lived. I think most of us have a pretty humble view of not believing that we've done that well in accomplishing all that God has for us. I want to tell you, I think, however, it should be our consideration. Lord, what do you have for me? Lord, what do you want me to do? And understanding that the choices we make today are going to have a consequence in our future. And I don't think it's fair to call it a millennial mindset. I don't think it's fair to disparage younger people. Um, I just think it's a fabric of humanity that often we will do things because they're before us to do without thinking of the consequences that will come from it. And so we need to pray about that and think about that. And uh, as we walk through Micah, hopefully draw from these passages some things that will help us in our walk with God this morning. So in that theme of wondering how we got where we were and how we got to uh, how we get to where we are today... We have to understand that there's just a series of choices that are made to get us there. And this passage, as, as heavy as it may be, I made the reference last week, this is not <clears throat> Jonah preaching to Nineveh. This is Micah preaching to the northern and southern kingdoms. And in doing so, he's telling them that choices had already been made, consequences are coming, I should say, the cause of the consequences that are upon them that he's declaring come from choices they had made. And they had long departed from God. 
and long decided to forsake his law and to forsake his word. I think the reference we made last week was to Deuteronomy 18. But as we move forward this morning, picking up to chapter 2, and we're going to find some important questions along the way, as well as some instructions. So in chapter 2, we find some of the reason or some of the reason behind God's judgment. And you're going to find that in these next uh, couple chapters. But in chapter 2, he says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. Now, something that we should know is that, again, I think we're masters at being a little bit of a lawyer in our own heart and mind. Coming back to that mentality of disowning uh, choices that we make. I think it's important for all of us to know that if we sin, we really do make a choice to do so. Can we agree? I think, I think the reason I ask it is because many times uh, we act like when we have sinned and the consequences have come that we're, we're just befuddled and, and, and we're left in a confusion as to how could this be? How could I have landed here? And we disassociate the fact that we made choices to get us there. In other words, there's planning involved. I remember, and I I think I learned a lot through dealing with this particular situation. But I was dealing with some situations with some people that were not uh, doing right according to the Bible. And trying to help guide them into doing what was right. And what came out is a a continual uh, habit of life where there was this communication of, well, I just couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. And yet, when I would explore the path towards sin, there was always exactly that. There was a path. And in that path, there would be a planning to accomplish that path. There would be a thinking about when I get home, I'm going to. Or when I get off work, I'm going to. And we start taking little steps to prepare that path so that when we find ourselves in the midst of the deed, there's no wonder how we got there. So can I share, can I share a personal story with you of this last week? So this last week, part of the reason I wasn't at the senior uh, fellowship is because uh, the mountain chewed me up and spit me out this week. Uh, what that means is I'm an archery elk hunter, and so I went off into the mountains this week. And 15 minutes into my hunt, there is a group of elk there. And I do what I normally do. I, I hunt them, I find them, and I go, boo! <laughs> and they run away. No, I don't do that purposely, but that's kind of what happens. And that happened 15 minutes into my hunt, and uh, off they ran, <laughs> like always. And uh, so I thought, well... The Lord just wants me to get exercise. Amen. So up the mountain I go because they're always up the mountain. And I'm hiking and I'm hiking and I'm hiking. And and, uh, I don't know how far I'm in now, but now a six by six bull comes in behind me. I did the same thing. Boo, he ran and there he went. And I said, well, the Lord just wants me to get exercise. That afternoon, I was a, I was a whoop puppy, right? So I, I, was, I was lying on the mountain. It's about three in the afternoon. I'm asleep. I can barely move my legs. My legs are cramping in ways I've never knew, known my legs to cramp. And I'm asking myself, how did I get here? And then I start coming off the mountain the next day, sleep on the mountain, come off the mountain the next day. And I'm hiking down and every step I'm taking, my body is saying, you stupid old man. <laughs> you stupid old man. And I'm saying, how, you know, I'm arguing with myself. How did I get here? You know how you got here. You can't, you, can't, you can't sit around and go visit people and not exercise and get up on this mountain and expect that you're going to feel like a 20-year-old. Well, I can tell you, I felt far from a 20-year-old. <laughs> you could take a shovel and cover me over. But how did I get there? How did I get there? I got there, choices I made, steps I took. And you get yourselves in these predicaments and you say, well, how did it happen? Well, here, they were devising evil in their beds. They were thinking you catch this, their, their mindset was contrary to walking with God. And I just want to tell everybody, you hear me say this from time to time, it's not rocket science. We make wa- walking with God far more complicated than it really is. If we have a mindset that is running contrary to God, what will the output of life be? Well, the output of life will be a life that walks contrary to God And it never goes well. God has a way of blessing, has a path 
of righteousness, a path that is good for us if we'll follow. But these folks were devising these plans in their bed. Verse 2, they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man in his heritage. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, against the family, that this family, do I devise an evil from which ye shall not remove your necks, neither shall ye go haughtily from this time, uh, for this time is evil. So in other words, they were directly violating God's plan. You know how that God told his people that they weren't really to take their land of inheritance from their own people, but they were, you know, caring about God was far from them now. And they got there one step at a time. Now, by the way, Christianity is just like this. The, the, there is no hope for the future if people won't choose to do right today. And what that means is the next generation can't guarantee that this church is going to be here if you don't do right. If you don't make the choice to honor God in your life as a next generation, there is no guarantee this church will stand. Let me ask you, do you think this church is safe? You know, we have only the strength of God that holds this body together. And the choices that we make to honor him or not. But it won't be a mystery. If we see this church someday fall, it'll be one choice at a time that we devised and a plan that we followed to not follow the Lord. Well, the Lord just simply says, look, I've, I've got a plan as well. And you need to know that I, as a sovereign God, will enact my plan. And my plan is a plan of judgment. Now, I want you to think about this because as we read further in this passage, the Lord does something that is, it just, it, boy, did it really strike me. Let's read further in verse 4 through 6, and, and then we'll get to the question here. In that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, we be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? You get the question there. Turning away hath divided our fields. How is it that this could happen is the cry. Therefore thou shalt have none that shall cast a cord by lot in the congregation of the Lord. And the idea there is you're not going to have somebody say, oh, this land belongs to you. This land belongs to you. You're not going to even have that because this land is going to be given away in judgment because I'm going to send the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They're going to come. They're going to take it from you. So you're not even going to have the question, is this your land or your land or your land? It's not any of it going to be yours. Prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. Now, he, he goes through that and then he does this in verse 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? He asks this question, <clears throat> and he lays out in verses 1 through 5, he lays out the sin of the people. Verses 6 through 11, he lays out the sin of the prophets, and he simply asks this question, do not my words do good to him that walks uprightly? I'm going to ask you that same question. Is God's word good to you? Is God faithful to you? to lead you in a way that is true and that is right? Does God ever lead you astray? No. In his kindness, God always tells us the truth. He tells us right where we are, and he tells us where we can know his mind. And we can know his mind in his word. So I just want to make the application for us this morning to say that the word of God is good to us. It is God's love, grace, and mercy that he has spoken to us through the word of God. We have his mind, we have his thoughts, we have his direction. So that the Bible tells us that this inspired word of God is all that we need to walk godly in Christ. The blessing is... You're not going to find truth by buying another book for $19.99. All the truth you need to be all that God wants you to be is found in that book in your hands. But what choice are you going to make about his word? Are you going to listen to it? I'll reference again. 
we have to make a choice whether we're willing to listen to what God has to say or not. Now, I'm going to speed forward. And now in verses 6 through 11, again, he's rebuking the prophets. He's basically saying, well, I, I'll go ahead and read it. It says, O thou that are named the house of Jacob, is, uh, I've read verse 7. He says, Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses. Uh, from their children have you taken away my glory forever. And he's basically telling them how they have taken from God's people for their own gain. So he lays out the sin of the people. He lays out the sin of the prophets. And what you find is no one is guilt-free in this context. Everyone is following their own path against God. Now, chapter 3, the judgment of chapter 3 is because that uh, the representat representatives of God's servants, the prophets, were leading people astray, not speaking for God, but loving money and what they could get from people. All right, we find this in verses 8 uh, through 12, if you'll read with me. Uh, Micah 3, 8 through 12. I'll read it for us, but if, if you'll follow along. Okay, it says, but truly I am full of power. Now, by the way, I, I, uh, I don't want to rush too fast here. Um, look at verses 5 through 8 of chapter 3, 5 through 7 of chapter 3. It says, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry, Peace. And he that putteth not into their mouths, uh, they even prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you that ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you, that ye shall not divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded, yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. And let me just say this, again, there is no safety outside of God, and what a tragic day when God becomes silent in our lives because we will not listen. Now, yes, you can make that choice, but why would you let God be silent in your life when his word is only ever good to us? It's a choice we make. You find conversely in verse 8, and that's why I drew back, because I want you to see verse 8. Micah says, but truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah, in his declaration of God's plan, is full of power compared to those who are speaking falsely. Now, again, what, what a horrific thing that there were those who were using God's people simply to get money. And what the passages seem to, seem to teach is that they were taking bribes from people to have them prophesy good things for them. The belief if they would say good things and give them what they want, and as well as judges taking bribes to give them what they wanted, they were totally violating God's plan to figuratively, as it says here, to eat and devour God's people for their own gain. In other words, they had gone so far from God that all they cared about was a view of hedonism. Give me what I want. Let me have my pleasure at everybody's cost. So make no mistake about it, when we choose to sin, it's always ugly. And it hurts people, not counting ourselves. And so I can't tell you how often I'll hear people say, uh, well, you know, my sin is my own, and I know I'm not doing the right thing, but I still love this person, I still love that person, and, and oh, no, I never do anything to hurt them, but it, it, yet I'm still making this sinful choice that hurts people. We lie to ourselves. You're never going to find blessing coming out of our sinful choice. We have to make a choice of understanding the truth of God's word, that his word is always ever good. Will we listen? I listened, I did this uh, the other day. Uh, I'm not a real fan of this. Maybe you're a skeptic as well. I, I'm, I'm skeptical about, I sh maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm skeptical about a lot of TV preachers, okay? And there was this guy that did a documentary on these TV evangelists, and they would walk out in the crowd and they would heal people, right? But this guy was a skeptic about this preacher, and he brought in a whatever it is, the thing basically catches radio waves 
that are going throughout the room. And he picked up a radio wave, and the preacher would always go, I, I, I hear the Lord calling me, I hear the Lord directing. And what he was doing, he was plugging his ear because he had a secret microphone, a spe secret speaker in his ear. And his wife was reading to him from the cards of what people had filled out. And he was using and, and manufacturing a spiritual moment to bite and devour God's people. I shudder to think what God does with that. My point is this. That's where the prophets were. He says, but truly I am full of power in verse 8. And he says, hear this, I pray you, ye heads of the house of Jacob and princes, in verse 9, of the house of Israel, that abhor judgment and pervert all equity. They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward, and the priests thereof teach for hire, and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say, is not the Lord among us? None evil can come upon us. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field and Jerusalem shall become heaps and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. Now, I always have to be careful when I illustrate and I want you to know that I take great care of what I say in this room, Okay. And sometimes I say things that may make you uncomfortable, especially when you have children in this room. And let me tell you how I do that. In my own kids' lives, I remember that I've got fourth grade and above in this room, okay? I know that I will use words sometimes that are somewhat veiled to my kids, but on purpose, so that I can explain to them further in language they can understand. But you need to know how ungodly these people were, and so... The history of this is that they were worshiping Baalism, a pagan fertility religion. There were people who were sacred uh, leaders of that religion who would sell themselves as a part of worship. Now, we're used to hearing that uh, when it came to the New Testament and, and Diana and worshiping her and, and all that. But it was a part of Baalism as well. Wages paid to these temple women that sold themselves, wages paid to them were in turn given by them to the temple as temple gifts. Apparently, this practice had permeated Samaria. This illicit activity pictured the illicit departure of God's people, the northern kingdom, from their solemn covenant in God. In effect, they were bound to God in a marriage agreement, and they were committing spiritual adultery, adultery while very much committing the same physically as a part of the worship of false gods. Pretty far out there, right? So let me say again, how far can we go outside of God when we start walking away from him? We can go pretty far. I would tell you that none of us should feel that we are safe outside of God. I'm convinced of this. Outside of God, we would all be desperately, not just lost in our sin, but lost in our way. I believe that it is truly only God in his grace and mercy and love for us and wants to fellowship with us that keeps us from the evil that we would do. Do you agree? I don't know if you agree or not, but that's, I fully believe that personally. It's only the grace of God that keeps me from being what I would have been outside of Christ. Now, we've been studying this on Tuesday nights. But in Colossians 3, but you are risen in Christ. And we are to do what? Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. For we are not, my paraphrase now, for we are not longer passionate or impassioned by the things of the world because we now, it doesn't mean there's not temptation to sin, but we are driven by a desire to love God. That's what we're supposed to be. When we start walking away from God, start, start treating God casually in our life like we really don't need to follow him, it is, it is a dangerous path. And everyone in this room needs to be desperate for fellowship with God every day. Now, as we move through this passage, I, I'm moving quickly now into chapter 4. 
So God's judgment is that because they had so deviated from the Lord, he is going to plow them as a field. So when you leave this building today, I want you to look north. And what you're going to see right behind this church is a cornfield. In just a very short time, the next month or so, I'm guessing, that's all going to be chopped down. And I don't know about you, but I like seeing the corn back there. I have visions of a corn maze, but, I, you know, anyway. So, anyway, I'm not sure that would be appreciated by our farmer that's leasing it. Um, and none of you young people get ideas, okay? Um, but in a few short, uh, short while, that's all going to be plowed. It's all going to be cut down, harvested, and then it'll be plowed under. And the idea is that what was fruitful is now desolate. Okay? So in chapter 4, what we read is that God has a future past judgment. And this is sprinkled throughout this book of Micah. So in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, I'm not going to take a long time here, but chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain. And it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord into the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Uh, interestingly enough, the word of God never went away. The word of God stands sure no matter what we might do. So here he says there is a future. And even though judgment is coming, there's a future. You'll find moving forward, of course, way too quickly. But in chapter 5, there's messianic promise of what God's going to do. So yes, he's going to lay these places desolate. But in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 5, Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of of troops, he hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. And the idea there is from time without end. This, in chapter 5, is the messianic chapter. Combined with what's been given in chapter 4. And God is saying that though there is a time of judgment, know that in God's mercy, he has a future. And his plan will be brought to fruition. Now, I know I've just covered a lot there, but look at verses 10 through 15 as well. 10 through 15 in the same chapter. 10 through 15. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord... That I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, and I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds, and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands, and I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. And not only there, but in verse 15, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. Now, we're in this room this morning, and you know, this isn't one of those messages where I'm hearing a lot of people say, well, amen, praise God. That's, that's encouraging because it's a message of judgment, right? So this is a, it's, these messages tend to be kind of very quiet in the house of God. Then you ask yourself, well, why does God give us a passage like this? I, I think one thing that we could draw away from the seriousness with which God treats this issue is that God is serious about his holiness. He's serious about sin. He's serious about fellowship. He's serious about his relationship with you. He's not playing games. He really does love you, and he wants you to walk with him. And his holiness does not tolerate injustice, inequity, sin, and living in a life that's deviant from God. He really is, are you with me? He really is God who is sovereign over all. Now the message that you find here, it is, it is again a harsh message. But I want to tell you, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people who say, I don't believe in a God that will send people to hell. 
All right, I'm going to be very frank with you then. If that's where you are in this assembly, I want to tell you, you're not disagreeing with me, but you have a different God than the God of the Bible. And you're making up your own God. You're making up your own path. And you can do what you want to do, but you'll find exactly what this passage says here is that when God brought judgment, his word was still standing. Now, we're coming to a very important part of chapter 6, so I'd like you to go to chapter 6 with me. And what you're going to find here is now another question that's asked. In chapter 6, you have, again, it's, it's not a small note. What, is, what, is the fir- what are the first words of chapter 6? Hello? Yes. Let's say it again. What are they? All right, so the job of a preacher is not to entertain God's people. This is not the grand show. I know, I am certain, that nobody came to this place today because the preacher was cool. That is, amen. That's one of the only amens I got today. (laughs) The job of a preacher is to declare the message of God. And I am, con- I, am, I am convinced that the majority of who come here and keep coming back, that what you want is not a fad, but the Word of God. And I, I so appreciate that. I so appreciate the freedom that I have to preach the Word of God clearly and plainly to you, and that you will come back. Not everybody will. And by the way, I'm, you know, it's yours to do, but I'm, I'm just saying that this passage says next, hear ye. So what are you going to do? I can't make you listen. You can't make me listen. What you come down is to the individual life that either walks with God or not. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can do it for me. Will we listen to what God says? Now we need a time out. Message like this. To hear means that you actually have to be receptive to hear it. I just want to ask you, are are you with me? Can I have your eyes this morning? Would any of you say this morning that God is working on you? A little more affirmation for my own good. Is God working on you? If God's not working on you, I don't know what kind of spiritual life you're living. Let me ask you, any of you struggle with sin this week? What? So listen, we, we have choices to make. Life is very short. And before long, it's going to be done. You really don't want to look over your life and, and be in dismay and say, oh, how did it ever happen? I didn't see this coming. Now, but I want to ask you this, by the way. Has God ever thrown any curveballs at you? We don't know it all, do we? Amen? We don't know it all. But we do know that the choices we make today have an effect tomorrow. All right. This, if there's anything that really struck me in this passage, besides the overall theme, what's in this, to me, It's heartbreaking um, when I think about what God is asking. So we're in chapter 6. So he says, Hear ye now what the Lord saith. Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's, what's the next word? controversy. In other words, his argument, his displeasure. And ye strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with who? All right, let's say it again. The Lord has a controversy with who? And he will plead with Israel. Now listen to this question. Would you read verse 3 out loud with me? O my people, what have I done unto thee? 
and wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. What are you going to say to that? What's your accusation against God? How is it the great God of the universe who is good continually to us, how is it that we have a complaint against him? What are you bitter against God about? I want to tell you where bitterness really comes from. I think it comes from this belief. My plan is better than God's plan because I care about my, my life far more than God does. And that's just not true. What's grieving, <laughs> this, this is pretty heavy. You know what the word wearied means? So he says, oh my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. You know what the word wearied means? It means to tire or to disgust. It also means to grieve and to loathe. So, so the Lord's opinion at the behavior of his people is, is the cry of a God who wants fellowship with his people to say, why is, uh, uh, fathom, fathom the great God of the universe saying, why are you disgusted with me? Why do you loathe me? Declare your reason. Declare your, declare your causes. I want to tell you that many times we'll blame God for the choices we made. And we'll believe the lie that our plan is better than God's plan and that we can do our own thing and somehow it's all going to work out well when we've walked away from God. And again... We like to lay the, what, what, is the, what is the number one phrase that we often uh, hear associated with a millennial? What's the, what's the next phrase? Millennial, you hear, what's the next phrase you hear? Anybody want to venture? Uh, snowflake. What's the idea? Not much stamina, not much strength. We all tend to do that when we start complaining against God and we become these people who start living and declaring a life that looks nothing like God and then say, God, why would you do this to me? And the Lord says, all right, the floor is yours. Lay it out there. And I want you to take a moment and to imagine, do you really want to stand before a God who's really been good to us, good to you, and really lay the accusation that your plan was better than his? that you know better than he knows? This is a difficult question, but can you really trust yourself? Can you really trust yourself if you were the great God of all, that you would have made the right choices, that you would have done the right thing? And that's the lie that we believe in our carnality, that somehow we would do better than God. What have I done? So what has the Lord done to you? How has he worried you? He then recounts how he's blessed him in verses 4 and 5. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. If you want to cross-reference that in your study, you want to look at Joshua 24, 1 through 13, and we're not going there this morning. If you want to look at what happened there, read Joshua 24, 1 through 13. The, the argument that God is making is if we would remember how God has blessed us, we would find appropriate motivation through gratitude to live for him. If we would remember how God has blessed us, we would find appropriate motivation through gratitude to live for him. It's, again, I'm, I'm sorry because I've, I've said this recently, especially on Tuesday night. It's one of my favorite questions, and that is, where would you be if it wasn't for the Lord? What would your life be like today if it wasn't 
for the Lord. Some of you this morning may still be outside of the Lord. You haven't come to him in faith. And you know what kind of a shambles life is. You know how hopeless life is. You know what it's like to live from one material thing to another. And is that really what you want your life to be all about? One material thing to another. So chapter 6 makes a pretty important statement after these questions. And it says, verses 6 through 9, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? In other words, can I somehow satiate the holy wrath of God by making sacrifices and by giving money and by giving stuff? God does not need your stuff. God doesn't need our verbal sacrifice. How far does this go? Shall I give him my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Verse 8, he has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Can all God's people say amen to that? Amen. The Lord wants you to walk humbly with him. It's high time some people in this room humbled themselves before God and realized your path will never save you. As sure as Israel and Judah would not escape God's wrath. This is a promise that it is coming. It's too late. The judgment is coming. Just as sure as God executed his judgment upon those nations, God will execute his righteousness upon the lost. And every lost soul will be separated from God in what the Bible calls the eternal lake of fire. It is the holy justice of God. And we make a choice with Jesus that either lands us in heaven or separates us from God. And that's faith in Christ, your personal faith in Christ. So what will you do with Jesus? I used to think, by the way, that sometimes, and I know this is true. You ever heard the story that sometimes God will knock us on our backs so the only place we have to look is up and we'll turn. You ever heard that and we'll turn to God? Well, I'm convinced that some of us are stubborn enough to go to the grave with it. And the most foolish thing anybody would ever do is to go to the grave defying the offer of mercy from a loving God. You know what's different for us today from this book of Micah? Is that God's judgment is pending and God's judgment is certain to come. But for us, he's provided a way of escape. That way of escape from the wrath of God, which is holy and just, is through no other means and no other path but the one and only person of the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. He has made it so you can be saved. You can be rescued. You can be redeemed. There is no reason anyone in this world has to go to hell. There's no reason anyone in this room has to live a life apart from God, suffering the consequences of choices you've made defiant of God. In the loving mercy of a holy God, he's extended to you fellowship, walking with him. Will we humble ourselves and walk with him? No one can save us from ourselves if we will not humble ourselves. Micah chapter 7 verses 18 through 20 still speaks of what God has in the future. And actually in verse, chapter 7 verse 6, he, he gives more of what's going on between family members and, and how, they're, uh, how they're fighting against God. I'm not taking time for... Uh, chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, but he, he gives more reason for why he's going to bring judgment. But in Micah 7, verses 18 through 20, the God of mercy says, I want you to know, my people, that while I'm bringing judgment, I have a future for you. And what he does here is he leans on the character of God. 
And here's what we read. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. In other words, even in God's judgment, there's mercy. Amen? All right, Psalm 103, and we're going to close this morning. Psalm 103. So all Bible preaching should lead us to a place of decision making. And in this room, after you've turned to Psalm 103, I'd like to have your eyes again. And I just want a moment of a heart to heart. So you're at Psalm 103, and let's just talk together, okay? Are you a sinner? In this room, everybody, the Bible declares, is a sinner from the sweetest little lady in this room, to the arneriest little kid, we're all sinners. And if you can't say amen to that, I'm sorry, but it's what the Bible teaches. Nobody knows you like God does. Nobody. You guys remember, this is old school, Remember, I don't, I don't know if I see too many of these anymore. Remember you get little things at school or things in the mailers which were scratch and sniff. You scratch it to reveal the fragrance. You young people don't even know what I'm talking about. There, that was a thing back in the day, along with wax candy and all that stuff. So anyway, you don't have to scratch much beneath that surface for anybody in this room to find that we're sinners. So my question for you is, what is it that God is dealing with you about? Now, you may not have anything screaming at you, but I I can guarantee you this, in this room, there are not only those, but probably many who know exactly, exactly what you're dealing with that's departed from God. You know And maybe you're the only one that doesn't. Now, maybe your family knows. Maybe there's other people in your life know, but it's true that for many of us, nobody else knows what's going on in here. But God does know. And you have a decision to make on what you're going to do with the God who loves you. You Do you know why we have? Do you know why we have the book of Micah? The book of Micah isn't given so that you will just see that God is going to execute his wrath. Matter of fact, in this very book, in this little chapter seven, seven chapter book, you have the promise of a Messiah who's going to come from these people who are going to be destroyed. And what we have today is the certainty of this teaching that God will do what he says he will do, And no man will escape the truth of the word of God. So what is the great hope that we have this morning? Well, in the midst of God's judgment, in the midst of God's wrath, there is mercy that is extended to us. We go to Psalm 103 and listen to the richness of God's mercy. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Read verse 3 out loud with me. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, and all God's people said. Read verse um, 4 out loud with me. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Again, verse 5. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle's. So I want to ask you this. Does the Lord satisfy you with good things in your life? I'm just going to ask you simply, is the Lord good to you? Let me ask you, can we really express that strongly enough that God is good to us? 
Can we really appropriately give gratitude enough for how greatness, how great God's goodness is to us? The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Remember that in Micah, this is part of why his judgment is coming, is because God's people were being oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Read verse 8 out loud with me. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. How often do we have a view of God that is just looking from heaven with a bat hidden behind his back, just waiting to smack us as soon as we step out of a line? We have this wholly wrong view of God. He is slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Verse 8 and 9, it says, He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins. Can we say amen to that? He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Read verse 12 out loud with me. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Amen? Where would we be if God remembered our sin to hold it against us? Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As far as man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as... Keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Now, what is the covenant that God has made with his people today? And that covenant that God has made is that there is promise in God that salvation is given to all who believe in the resurrected Christ. That is his promise for all who will believe today. So I will say again for me. I'm appreciative of the fact that God is merciful to me, a sinner. It is so heartwarming to me to know no matter where we are with everybody else in the world and whatever we're dealing with, God, when we come to him and surrender him, he, he throws our sin as far as the east is from the west. God, amazingly, God wants fellowship with you. And when you think about that, what do we have to offer this holy, great God that he would want us? But he does. So here is the greatest invitation that the world has really ever known. That a holy, righteous God who we have sinned against time and time again is still yet merciful, loving, and wanting to be in fellowship with us today. So the question as we're done with Micah this morning is what will you do with Jesus? What will you do about the choices that you and I make? My prayer for all of us, myself included, is that we'll humble ourselves enough to really listen to God. Humble ourselves to not think that we're better than somebody else and that we're not better than that person, but we need God's mercy, we need God's grace, and we're sinners saved by grace who need the continual fellowship of a great God who loves us. This is the invitation. The invitation is he will save all who come to him, and for all who come to him, he will walk with you in fellowship if you will hear him. So, what choice will we make?